So that's my claim. Entrepreneurship is management, just not the general management of Fred Taylor. The unit of progress of that new entrepreneurial management is something I call validated learning. This is really at the crux of what the Lean Startup is all about. We have been trained in the 20th century to focus our energy hyper uh, acutely on trying to get our workplace to run as efficiently as possible. And the definition of that efficiency is making the most high quality stuff as efficiently as possible. So any of us who are trained as engineers, we've been trained to look at a specification document and figure out how do I achieve this specification at minimum effort. Does that sound right? And if, if I'm an engineer who comes to you and says, listen, I found a way to achieve that same spec at 80% you know, of the cost, you're going to give me a huge promotion because you'll be so excited I save you 20% of the time. Here's my question for this definition of progress. If we as entrepreneurs are building something that nobody wants, why are we proud of having done it on time and on budget? That's fundamentally the problem that we face as entrepreneurs. More often than not, we are simply building the wrong things extremely efficiently. So I have this image of us driving a car off a cliff, but we're bragging about the gas mileage. It's like, we're very efficient, 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 as we go right off the cliff and crash. That's the fundamental problem. Uh, Daniel mentioned that I started a company called Imview. And Imview was a 3D avatar social networking company. But we didn't know it at the time. We thought it was a 3D avatar instant messaging company. Because this was 2004 and our aspiration was trying to become the next AOL, back when that was still cool. And so we built this 3D avatar instant messaging program. Now, we're in a business school, so let's talk corporate strategy for a second. You're building a new instant messaging program. What do we know strategically about instant messaging? First thing we know is that instant messaging is a network effects business. You guys have been taught that already? Network effects, not along. Network effects means the value of the whole network increases with the square of the number of participants. So if you're the only person in the world with a telephone, not very useful. If everybody has a telephone, super useful. Make sense? Everyone in 2004 already had an instant messaging client. They were already locked into some platform. So what else do you know? We know that instant messaging has high switching costs. Because if you want to bring a new IM network to market, you have to get people to switch away and bring all their friends with them to your new network. Does that make sense? Therefore, in like proper MBAs, we said, instant messaging is a business with high barriers to entry. Therefore, we cannot build an instant messaging client. Making sense so far? So we had a strategic brilliance. Check this out. Here was our idea. We would make an instant messaging add-on that would interoperate with all of the existing clients so that you wouldn't have to switch to a new program. Does that make sense? Doesn't that seem like a good idea? And here's the best part. It would cause our product to spread virally through the existing networks like an epidemic. Because in order to use the product, you would click a button to say, go 3D in my conversation, and we would send a link directly to your partner, inviting them to download in view too. And so every time you want to use the product, it's inherently viral. Who thinks that's a good idea? Sounds good, right? We've got some students of business strategy, I can see, because they're nodding along. Like, yeah, makes sense. I find that in Michael Porter's textbook somewhere. It says, do exactly this. <laughs> There's a tiny flaw with the strategy in reality, which is that every single thing I just said isn't true. But sounds good. Sounds good, by the way, are the two most dangerous words in entrepreneurship. Sounds good. Seems like it should work. Let me tell you a little anecdote, though, I found out the hard way. We shipped this product in about six months, took us to build it. And, um, I guess I should, I should explain. Those of you who are engineers will know the saying, time, quality, money, pick two. People familiar with that? That's engineering speak for if you rush me, I'm going to produce a crappy product. And so we only had six months and not very much money. And we said, we are going to put this product out in the market, so help us God. We we're going to do it. And so we shipped a product after six months that was frankly terrible. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do any kind of sugarcoating of this. This is a product that would be more likely to crash your computer then it would be to give you a delightful 3D avatar experience. So I was very nervous. I was the chief technology officer, after all. So what's my job? To make sure we put out high quality technology. So I wasn't exactly thrilled with the prospect of putting out something that would crash people's computer. I had this image in my mind, you know, some enterprising reporter would see our thing after we shipped it, and they'd write an article. Idiots at IMVU don't know what quality software means. And that would be the end of my career. I had this picture of like a mugshot, you know, in the engineer's hall of infamy. But we did it anyway, and at first I was actually relieved because nobody would even try the product. <laughs> so at least nobody found out how bad it was, right? I was like, well, phew, dodged a bullet there, and then I was like, wait a minute. 
what did I just spend the last six months of my life doing? And to make a long story short, we tried and tried and tried to get customers to download this product. And after running out of trying everything we could think of, we finally resorted to that absolute last resort, which is talking to customers. We said, all right, let's find out what's going on here. And I want you to just imagine this for a second. Here is a you know, young person excited about our new 3D avatar thing. We bring him into our office, have a focus group, and we would say, okay, customer, uh, try this new instant messaging add-on. And they would say, what is that? Like, it's an instant messaging add-on. It interoperates with all your thing. And they're like, what is that? I don't know what an instant messaging add-on is. That's not a category that means anything to me. Is it an IM client or not? And we'd be like, sort of. But it interoperates to avoid the network effects and the switching costs. And you got a picture like a 17-year-old being like, what are you talking about? And basically, like, we've had this argument constantly. We'd be like, listen, we're paying you to be here in this usability test. So you will download this thing. And they'd be like, fine. <laughs> That's never a good sign to begin with. We'd force them to do it, and they'd download it, and they loved the 3D avatar, and they loved customizing their avatar, and they would check it out, and they'd be like, ooh, this is so fun. And then we would say, okay, time for the strategic brilliance. Time to invite one of your friends. They were like, no thanks, I decline. Why? I don't know if this thing is cool yet, and so I'm not going to invite one of my friends to something that might be lame, because then they're going to think I'm lame. And we're like, no, but it'll be so fun once you invite one of your friends. Trust us. And they're just like looking at us, total deal breaker. And we tried that trick again. We're like, no, we're paying you to be here, so you're going to do it. And I kid you not, most customers were like, I'll give you your money back. Because like in the definition of mission critical product for a teenager is right there in the dictionary. It says, do not make me look stupid in front of my friends. So those of you who work in enterprise software think only you have mission critical product, like so, au contraire. Our customers cared a lot about that. It was a complete deal breaker. We could not convince them to do this behavior. They kept saying, let me just try it myself first to see if it's cool, and then I'll invite one of my friends. And we were from the video game industry, and we knew exactly what that meant. It meant single player mode. So yes, we then proceeded to build single player mode version of a social communication product. It seemed like a really good idea at the time. See, here's the thing. We thought we should get a gold star bonus points because we were listening to customers. And aren't you supposed to listen to customers, right? Wrong. Here's what happened. Bring the customer in, pay them to download the damn thing again, <laughs> have them install the software. They love the avatar. We'd be like, okay. They would try it by themselves. They'd see all the cool things their avatar could do. And we would say, okay, now invite one of your friends. They'd be like, no, thanks. Why not? This thing isn't cool. And we're like, but we told you it wasn't going to be cool. You made us build this feature and the whole thing. Because remember, we're like, you told us what to do and we did it. So shouldn't we, where's our gold star? But guess what? In entrepreneurship, there's no gold stars. You never get a, an award and you never get promoted. All you do is survive to face the next challenge. That's the highest praise you can get. Other, it's like survive or die. That's it. So to make this long story a little short, we had to pivot. And a pivot, just for those who are not familiar with the most overused buzzword of 2011, a pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. And it was pretty painful. And I want you to sympathize with me personally for a second, if you would. Guess who wrote the software that had to get thrown away as a result of the pivot? That, that would be me. I wrote thousands and thousands of lines of the most elegant, the best architected, the most well-factored, and just frankly beautiful software that has ever been written in all time. And I did it using all the latest product development techniques, agile, what they call extreme programming. So it was well factored and continuous integration and unit tests. For all the uh, people who understand what I'm talking about, we really did it to the T. And it still got thrown out. And I was pretty upset because agile development is supposed to help us el eliminate waste in product development. And here I was committing the biggest waste of all, building something that nobody wants. And I kind of felt like, gee, did I even have to be here the last six months? If all my work got thrown away, couldn't I have been on a beach somewhere, you know, have a vacation while my co-founders found out this horrible thing and then they bring me in later? And those of you who have been managers or entrepreneurs will know the excuse that I used to feel better, which was, well, no, I had to be there. It was important. People see where I'm going? If I hadn't been there, we wouldn't have learned this important thing, that namely what customers don't want and therefore executed this, excuse me, this pivot. Incidentally, managers who claim to have learned something are generally on the brink of being fired. So this is actually not that fun an excuse to use. Let me explain. If you're a general manager, some of you who have worked in big companies will know what I'm talking about. Uh, you come to your boss and you're like, I have really good news. I learned something important about what customers don't want because I built this plan, I successfully executed it, and now I have missed all my targets 
And, but the good news is, if you just give me another year and another million dollars, it's totally going to work this time. That, that usually is the last report you will ever give in your company, because either it means you didn't make a very good plan, in which case you should be fired, or even worse, it means that you made a good plan and failed to execute it, in which case you should be like double fired, if that's even possible, fired with extreme prejudice. <laughs> And yet in entrepreneurship, since we have this extreme uncertainty, we always fail. Our plans never turn out the way that they, uh, they're supposed to. So what do we do about that? I want us to rehabilitate the concept of learning. Because here's the, here's the way my thought process worked. It was like, wait a minute. Why am I using learning only now as an excuse to make myself feel better? How come the word learning didn't come up even one time during the past six months? What did my co-founders and I talk to each other about? You can guess. We talked about what features do we absolutely have to build and not build? What bugs do we have to fix? I mentioned before, what customers do we listen to and who do we ignore? The word learning never crossed our lips one time until we had to justify a failure. And I said, if our goal the last six months was to learn this important thing about customers, why did it take six months? For example, we supported, I think, 12 different IM networks for interoperability out of the gate. Would our learning have been the same if we supported only six? Yeah. What if we support only three? Yeah. What about only one network? We support only one client. Would we still have been able to learn that customers do not want to do this activity? Sure. Now, that's easy to say. You're like, oh, that's great. But wait a minute. That's 10 times less work for the same value. That was very upsetting. But that ain't nothing compared to this thought that was really disturbing. Because get this. What if we had just created a single web page? with nothing more on it than a screenshot of the product we intended to build and a giant download button? Would we even have had to build page number two where we apologize that the product's not available yet? Or would a 404 have been sufficient? What did I say before? I said they wouldn't download the product. That means they literally wouldn't click the button, so who cares what's on page two? Now you can see why this is disturbing to me because I had to pull out my business card, and what does it say on my business card? Chief Technology Officer. It does not say chief crappy one day landing page experiment officer. So then I was like, what am I supposed to do with my time? How is it possible that my six months of dedicated work could have the same value as a crappy one page you know, experiment that some designer could have whipped together in an hour? That was really disturbing and that is at the heart of what I'm trying to get at. That the value in an entrepreneurial situation is learning whether we're on the path to a sustainable business. Everything else that we do is waste.